for the invitation to speak. Very excited to talk to you guys today. Uh, this is something I've been working on for a while. I started my work on computational pathology and machine learning uh, back when this was sort of a newer field. Uh, this was back in 2006, 2007, around that time, so about uh, 13 years ago. And uh, since then, it's grown into a pretty big field with a lot of exciting developments. So uh, today and tomorrow, I'm basically going to talk about some of the developments in that field as they pertain to my work. Um, so just for a little bit of background, I am an assistant professor of pathology and anatomical sciences at a medical school, but my training was in biomedical engineering. And I actually have a dual appointment at the Department of Biomedical Engineering in Buffalo. And one of the reasons that I am in the medical school, I'm not a pathologist, I'm not a medical doctor, uh, but the goal for our program is actually to bring some of the engineering developments of the past 20 years into medical practice so that students that are taking our classes to become doctors are learning about how machine learning works and how artificial intelligence works. Because we believe that this technology is getting so good and providing so much benefits to healthcare that the doctors of tomorrow are gonna to be using this in their day-to-day -day practice. And so by training students today how to use these technologies and how they work, uh, the goal is to train uh, doctors who are better prepared for the kind of pathology that they'll be uh, uh, working on in the future. So my goal for today is really to introduce to you my sort of design philosophy when it comes to machine learning. I'm going to talk about pathology and healthcare in particular, but I'm going to try some of the uh, workflow ideas that I give you and some of the advice that I'll be giving is generic for any kind of machine learning. So whether you want to do this for healthcare, whether you want to do this for research or for industry, if you want to go into finance, there's a lot of exciting opportunities to use machine learning in uh, the financial sector. So a lot of these different uh, uh, fields can benefit from this type of design philosophy that I'll be talking about. So uh, just to, oh, I think it got disconnected maybe. Or you might have to click on the, there we go, okay. So just to start with some basic definitions so that everyone is on the same page. I don't know what your familiarity is with machine learning and AI, but my view is that machine learning is basically any technique that uses some collected data to do something useful. And when we say something useful, that could be a lot of different things. So we could do knowledge discovery, where you're looking for patterns in sets of data. You can try to simplify a complex phenomenon by building a model. So if you want to simulate the stock market or uh, drug delivery systems or things like that, then you can simplify this model, this uh, system by building a model and using that to make predictions. You can place category, uh, data into different categories, so you can assign labels to things. So one of the projects that I work on is trying to identify patients that have a certain type of tumor. And so the labels that I'm assigning are, do they have this tumor or not? And so what you would do is use a big data set where you know what the patients are to train a model that can then make that prediction on new data. And you can also try and predict the values of future data. So if you wanted to know something, a value of something in the future, you could do a regression analysis to try and figure out what that number might be in the future. So these are all different types of machine learning and you can see that there's some overlap between machine learning and traditional statistics and model building. So the job of the machine learning expert, the person who engages in the work of actually building these models, is to understand and identify the goal of the system. So what is it exactly that you're trying to do? This is actually kind of a tricky question when you get into healthcare, especially if you don't have a background in, in biology. Uh, you have to collect data and make sure that the data that you collect is of sufficient quality to actually perform machine learning because if you have noisy data or incorrect data, then you won't be able to build an accurate model. You want to be able to select the model or algorithm that you want to use. So within machine learning, there are hundreds of different algorithms for doing different things. And so your job is to sift through all these different models and pick the best one for the task at hand. And you want to evaluate the system in terms of the costs. And again, this is very problem dependent. So depending on your application and your field, the costs may be, may be different. So this is all in the purview of the machine learning expert. There's a bunch of different ways that you can carve up the field of machine learning. And I'm only gonna talk about a few of them here. Most of them have to do with the type of labels that come associated with the data. Okay, so in supervised learning, 
you basically use a data set that is labeled with some characteristic that you'd like to know, and you use the data that you collect, the features that you collect, to classify new or unseen data. So I want to build a model that will predict whether patients have tumor type A or tumor type B. And I know that all the patients that I'm going to look at have some kind of tumor, and it's either going to be A or B. So what I do is I collect a bunch of labeled data where I know what the tumor type was, and I collect a bunch of features and build a model. And then when a new patient walks in the door, I don't know what type of tumor they have already. So the prediction I'm making is what label should I assign to that new patient? Unsupervised learning is when you don't have any labels for your data. I'm just given a bunch of data, and I'm trying to find patterns or natural clusters in that data. So I might be sequencing every person who, uh, uh, doing a genome sequencing of every person who comes into my clinic. And I don't know what diseases they have, I just have a bunch of genomes. I might create an unsupervised learning approach to see if there are groups of patients that are separate from all the other groups. And they may indicate some kind of disease state. And this is useful, first of all, if you don't have any labels, but also if you're just interested in learning new things about your data set, because sometimes you can find new diseases or new variants by doing this kind of analysis. In semi-supervised learning, you kind of combine these two. So you have some data that has labels and some data that doesn't. And so you can use two different types of data sets together to build a model. This is very useful if your labels are very expensive to get. So if you're trying to build a model where each label is tough to get, but you can actually collect the data pretty quickly, then you can label some of the data set and use that to build a model. Um, and that's called su semi-supervised learning. And then reinforcement learning is actually a different type of learning where you're trying to teach an AI algorithm to complete some complex task. So if you've seen on the news, there's been uh, a lot of stuff in the last few years about AI systems that learn to play video games. And this is a reinforcement learning approach. So uh, Google has made a bunch of these algorithms that will play StarCraft and Go and all these other games. And those are reinforcement learning approaches. So in my course that I teach on machine learning and in my lab where I teach students how to do machine learning, I spend the majority of my time talking about data and data sets because it's the most important thing that you learn in doing this work. Um, the algorithms that we use are free. They're freely available. You can download them from Google. They're implemented in a bunch of Python libraries. Uh, so it's not actually difficult to figure out how to actually do the, uh, the building of a model. What's really expensive and what's really important is the data sets that you collect and the type of data that you get. So it's important to understand what we mean by data. And again, my bias is I'm coming from a healthcare uh, side of things. So my data all looks kind of like this. So in some cases, you can have images like uh, in this histopathology image. This is a tissue section that's been sliced, stained, and put on a glass slide to look at under a microscope. Uh, this over here is a CT scan. So this is a cross section. Uh, it's non-invasive. It's a, basically an image of the density of the different tissues in the body. And this is a, a type of radiology. And these two, because they're images, they have some interesting properties. So in the case of the histopathology image, the color of each pixel has a meaning that I can use to build a model to detect things like, like cells or tumors. Uh, the spatial relationship between pixels, so the fact that this pixel is over here and this one over here, has a specific meaning. So there's geometry involved, there's architecture involved. Over here we have a gene microarray image, which basically is just the expression levels of different genes, and they get grouped according to their similarity. So this data doesn't have any uh, spatial dimension to it. It's basically just a bunch of genome uh, profiles. Uh, but we can color it in terms of the strength, and so that has some meaning, and so my model needs to take that into account. And then over here is basically just a spreadsheet of patient demographic data. So if you go to a clinic and they give you a, p a form that you need to fill out, you know, family history, symptoms, all that kind of stuff, all of that stuff can be used to inform your idea of what a patient looks like, and you can use that data to build a model. So understanding these different data types is critical to be ab being able to build a useful model. In pathology, we actually have to make the argument that you can go from this type of data to a prediction of patient disease state and patient, potentially patient outcome. So in order to do that, we kind of have to make a few arguments to the pathologists that are going to be using these tools. So the first is that the structure of your data, the structure of your, uh, your images, has some primary data associated with it. So when you take a picture of someone's tissue section, that actually is the source of the data that you can use to build a quantitative model. 
Because typically it's just looked at under a microscope and they say, okay, there's a lot of cells here and they don't look normal and so I'm going to write that down in my lab report. And so what we want to say is, no, no, you can actually measure things about those cells. You can quantify those cells. And because you can do that, you can use machine learning. We can quantify the biological structure. So we can measure all of these different properties that are typically used to understand the type of tumor that you have. And we can use that to build our model. And we can model the relationships between that structure and disease. And this is kind of intuitive, where if you know that a tumor is a type of tissue that is growing out of control, then you expect there to be more cells. Uh, so when you look at a tissue section and you see that there's too many cells and they're not in the right configuration, you'd say, okay, you have a tumor and it's aggressive or not based on my training. Uh, what, we, what we're saying with this is that you can actually measure all of those quantities and you could use them to build a model to uh, understand the disease a little bit better. And we see this in the medical literature as well. So this is a figure that was taken from a study that was done uh, quite a few years ago that looked at uh, tumor appearance or tumor differentiation as evaluated on a glass slide and a recurrence score that's given by genomics. And what this does is show that it, while it's not perfect, as the tumor gets more poorly differentiated, the recurrence score, which means the risk that the patient is going to have a bad outcome to treatment, is going up. And so what we are doing here is we're tying the, the morphology of the tumor, the sort of uh, the appearance of the tumor, to the actual genomic characteristics of that tumor and the eventual outcome of the patient, which can be seen here. So these are survival curves, which says how many patients, what percentage of patients survived after a certain period of time. And if you cluster them out according to their genomic score, then you can actually see that there's a difference here. So if you're in this group, you're more likely uh, to fail treatment at a certain period of time versus if you're in this group or if you're in this group. And so what this allows us to do is we can draw a link between patient outcome, so how long is the patient going to, going to live statistically, to recurrence score, which is based on genome, and that's based off of the tumor grade. So in theory, you could look at the image and you could say, okay, based on these characteristics, we predict that you belong in this arm of this curve or this arm of this curve. Okay? So that's kind of the argument that we're making for why you can use images to build models that can be used to influence uh, or predict patient outcomes. Now, it's not as simple as that because obviously doctors look at more information than just an image. They don't just take an x-ray and then tell you uh, what you should do they sort of have a whole battery of tests that they might perform to identify the type of disease you have and the type of treatment that's appropriate. And so a friend of mine from a couple of years ago did a study where he looked at image-based predictors of outcome to non-image-based predictors of outcome. So this is histology for prostate cancer, and this is mass spectrometry, which is a measurement of proteins. And he built a classifier for each of these independently that tried to predict whether the patient was going to fail treatment. And it turns out that you can generate a predictor using just histology. You can generate a predictor using just mass spectrometry. But when you combine the two sources of data in an intelligent way, you get a classifier that performs even better. So from an information theoretic standpoint, what this means is that there's information in each of these modalities that is independent of the other, right? So you're mass spectrometry data doesn't give you the best performance. You need that image data to increase the ability of the system uh, to predict outcome. Right? So by, by merging different types of data together, you can make a better prediction. And again, as I said at the beginning, we're trying to bring this idea to the students at the time that they're being trained. So uh, we don't have people that are just stuck in their specialty of radiology or pathology. We actually get them to understand that you can uh, describe and quantify disease at all kinds of different length scales and with all types of different data. So you can go from radiology or CT scans to biopsies to electron microscopy to genome analysis of individual molecules and proteins. And all of this is different data that describes the same condition. And so one of the things that the engineers need to do from the machine learning side is figure out which of these modalities is going to give you the information that you need to combine together to give you a good prediction of whatever your goal is. Okay. So how do we actually go about building a machine learning solution to a problem? 
Uh, and I'm going to cover a couple of different things. I'm going to cover some of the questions you need to ask at the beginning of a project. I'm going to talk about some of the concerns with data that you might experience. And I'll talk about, um, I'll actually talk about some of the nitty gritty details about how you should divide up your data set to make sure that your machine learning algorithm is robust. And I'll talk a little bit about pathology and healthcare, in fact, uh, concerns in particular, especially when we get to the discussion of costs and the cost of misclassification in different scenarios. Uh, what kind of questions are going to help you be most efficient with your time, your effort, and your money? Uh, if you ask smart questions at the beginning, you don't have to ask silly questions six months or a year from now. And one of the things that I need to do quite a bit as a biomedical engineer is interface with collaborators who don't know anything about machine learning, uh, but they have to provide me with data that is good so that I can use it in my system. They need to be able to describe features to me in a way that I can quantify. And I need to be able to explain to them what I need from them in order to be able to build these systems. So communication and interfacing is one of the big uh, uh, things that as a biomedical engineer, I need to know how to do. So I'll talk a little bit about that. So if you're in engineering or any kind of STEM field, you've probably seen a lot of flow charts and, and process diagrams before. And this is mine. This is the one that I use for a lot of my new projects. And this is basically the life cycle of a machine learning algorithm. And I'll go through each of these in turn. But essentially, you start out by assessing the problem and figuring out what it is you want to do, acquiring and visualizing some data so that you have some sense of context for what it is you're trying to do. Then there's a lot of code and a lot of boring stuff about how you prepare the data for actually uh, being used in a modeling algorithm. You can select which model you're going to use and sort of train it and evaluate it using your training set. And then you can fine tune the model that you've selected and optimize it for your particular data set before evaluating against your testing set. And then all of these steps go into a feedback loop where you need to continuously monitor the system to make sure that it is good. This is particularly important if you're planning on going into industry and you want to have a model that you're going to sell and you're going to update and you're going to keep it going for business purposes, this is critically important. Because if you find information in this feedback loop that your model is failing on real world data, you need to go back into each one of these steps and figure out what needs to be altered. Okay. So we'll start out by talking about assessing the problem, defining the scope of your problem, the goals, and the type of environment that you're going to be working in. And this is where I would say about 60% of my time is spent in understanding sort of the goals of a project when we're first starting out. So we always start out with a problem statement. So what is the problem statement in one sentence? If you could distill down a project into one sentence, uh, or sorry, if you could distill down a problem into one sentence, then what would it be? And this is separate from the machine learning test. This is not presupposing any, any engineering. This is just what situation exists in the world that we would like to address. So here's an example of a problem statement that's pretty good. A pathologist has to review slides of cytology, so images of cells, to identify whether a tumor is malignant or benign. And the reason that this is a problem is that this manual review of slides can be very tedious and time consuming for the pathologist. Most pathologists are overworked. There's many parts of the world that don't have pathologists. So the ability to make pathologists more efficient with their work is very valuable. And so this is something that we're interested in. So the next thing you have to do is a literature search or a literature review. What are the current solutions to the problem that people have already tried? If you identify that it's a problem, there must be some people who've tried to uh, address it, either from an engineering standpoint or from a money standpoint. So if it's being addressed, how is it being addressed? And what data is currently routinely collected? It's far easier to work with data sets that are automatically generated or continuously generated than to build a data set from the ground up. So we could say that based on cytology images, pathologists will sit down and determine by eye what these things look like. And there's not really any way currently that they sort of get around this task. They have to sit down in front of the microscope and, and look at each one of these slides. So this gives us an idea of our starting point. We have images. We have some criteria that they've identified that can help them distinguish between benign and malignant. And so that's how it's being done normally. One thing that is critically important that I think not enough people do from the engineering world is listening to the experts 
who are asking them to perform a task because they're the ones who are eventually going to make use of whatever algorithms you build or whatever systems you build. And they're a very valuable source of what we call domain knowledge. So that's the context of the problem that you need to understand in order to build a good model, right? So you might say, well, I'm a machine learning expert or I'm a computer vision expert. I don't need to know about tumor biology, which you don't need to be as good as the pathologist at understanding tumor biology, but you do need to know why certain cells look the way that they do. What are the potential sources of variation in your data that you need to be aware of? In the case of pathology images, the images themselves, the intensity of the images can vary quite a lot. So from a computer vision standpoint, this is a very big problem because if you train your system using just one type of data from one place, then you're not going to get the variety of different samples that you need to be able to run the system in a number of different places. And you know that pathologists already distinguish benign from malignant tumors, so they're an important source of data to help you drive your feature extraction. Uh, so if you don't know what it is you're looking at and you don't know what differentiates the two different types of classes, then you're not going to know how to engineer your features appropriately. And our job is really to convert qualitative features, like the cells don't look right, to quantitative features, like something you can measure or teach the computer how to measure. So we might talk to a pathologist and they might say, well, actually, there's a list of different features that we look for. So in the best case scenario, they actually just hand you this list. Normally what you need to do is sit down with them for a day or two and watch them look at slides and watch them perform the current solution to the problem that they do. And that's extremely valuable. And if you're doing something like finance, for example, and you want to understand how the stock market works, sitting down with someone who actually is an investor and listening to how they evaluate different stocks is very valuable for understanding how their system works and how you should be addressing the problem. So again, in the best case scenario, the pathologist might just give you a list of features that you can then code up in, in whatever programming language you want to extract these features from the images, and then that provides you with your initial source of feature data. Another important thing that a lot of people skip is actually looking at the data. And for things like images, this is really important. It's surprising to me how many people write code to, to evaluate images without actually looking at the images that they're interested in. Um, and I like this quote from uh, Dr. Dykstra, a picture might be worth a thousand words and an algorithm is worth a thousand pictures, uh, which is nice. But the point, important thing is you can look at the picture and get a lot of information about what type of problem you're dealing with much faster than having someone describe it to you. So here are two images of cytology. And these represent two different types of tumor. This is a benign tumor on the left. And this is a malignant tumor on the right. If you're not familiar with these kinds of images, this is basically tissue from a patient that's been dissociated, which means the cells are kind of just floating on their own. And so what they do is they look at individual cells, individual nuclei, and they try and figure out whether those cells are consistent with a benign tumor or a malignant tumor. Uh, this is part of a data set that was generated from the University of Wisconsin in the US. And this is a publicly available data set. Both the images and the features that were extracted from those images are publicly available. So you can download them and use them to, to learn a little bit about machine learning. But essentially, this is what they look at. And they look at this under the microscope. And they use that list of features I, I put up a second ago. And they look at each nucleus. And they sort of perceive these different features. So radius, how big is it? Texture, does the, does the nucleus look smooth or is it all rough and bumpy? Um, and, and so on. And they try and figure out, based on the collection of those values for each nucleus, whether or not the uh, image belongs to the benign class or the malignant class. Okay. Another thing that's critically important, especially in healthcare, is understanding your performance targets. Right? So what are the goals of your system? Right? We want to distinguish between benign and malignant. But what is your actual target? How do you know if your system is actually doing well? So you need some number that you, can, that you can calculate from your performance to say whether or not you've hit the goals or hit the target of the system, right? So medical tests, I'm sorry to say, are never 100%. So these predictions always have sort of per percentages attached to them. But if you're trying to evaluate your system, does it need to be 100% accurate in order to be useful? Uh, does it need to be, is accuracy the best measure, or do you want to minimize false negatives? So you never tell someone 
they don't have a tumor when they do, because then they won't get treatment, and so that's bad. Uh, but if you tell someone they have a tumor and they don't, that's a false positive, that carries some risk too, because you might perform surgery, chemotherapy on someone who doesn't need it. Um, and so it's very important to understand what metric you're going to use to say my algorithm is doing well or my algorithm is doing poorly. And this determines sort of, this actually drives the development of the algorithm because if you're getting good accuracy but you have a lot of false positives, that might be way worse than your accuracy going down a little bit but preferring false negatives. So you need to be aware of, of how to tune your system once you get to the performance tuning stage. A couple of other sort of random questions. Uh, how much data is available for the problem that you're interested in? I'll show a slide in a little bit that suggests that if you don't have more than 50 samples, then you shouldn't even try machine learning at all because that number is too small to provide useful statistics. Uh, so if you can reasonably expect a few hundred samples, that's one thing. If you know that you have millions of samples, like if you're working for Facebook and all your users, each user counts as a sample, that's a lot of data to deal with. So you have to have a, an understanding of how much data you have whether the data is labeled or not, and how difficult it is to acquire new labels uh, or new data is very important. So can you go back to your data providers and say, can you give me some additional labels or can you scan for me 200 more slides, right? Uh, how much of effort is that? What type of machine learning? This is something that you should have already uh, uh, assessed from the labels. And one thing, uh, you know, in the US when we apply for funding for the, to the NIH or wherever, uh, one of the things we need to show is not only is the system going to work, but if it works, it's going to have a big impact on the field. Uh, another thing that engineers are very bad at, or very good at, is focusing in on a particular challenge, right? I'm going to build a system that will predict benign versus malignant every single time. And you spend, you know, a PhD or a, or a, a master's of science, and you succeed, and you get your performance. But then it turns out that doctors don't actually care about that because it's very easy for them and very cheap for them to do it themselves. So then the algorithm that you spend so much time on actually doesn't change the field of pathology or of healthcare. So one thing to pay attention to is assuming that your project is successful, what is the impact or what is the benefit uh, for the rest of the field? So at this point, you've done a lot of work in looking at data, you've talked to your experts, you've assessed the problem, you've figured out what your, what your target is. And at this point, it's very important to stop take a moment, and identify whether or not machine learning is even the right tool for the job. Because a lot of times, it's not. And when you're trained as a data scientist, then everything is a data science problem. So you want to make sure that you reevaluate and validate whether or not machine learning is the tool that you should be using for the job. Uh, you can't really see it on the projector, unfortunately, but um, this is a machine learning flowchart that I stole from the uh, documentation for the scikit-learn package, which is a Python package for doing machine learning. And it has all these different, you start here, and it has all these questions that it asks uh, to try and direct you to the appropriate algorithm uh, for your problem. So based on the number of samples, whether you're trying to predict a category or detect structures. And there's two circles here that I think are, are useful for this discussion. One is over here where it says, if you have less than 50 samples, get more data. So that was what I was talking about before. And then if you are trying to predict data structure and you have too many samples, or not enough samples rather, it says tough luck, you just can't do it. So there are some problems that even the people who are invested in machine learning algorithms say, you shouldn't even try machine learning for that, you should try some other technique. Uh, but for all these other ones, it provides this, this nice flow chart. So this will give you an, an idea, you know, after you've assessed the costs of building the system, the costs of the current uh, solution to the problem you're dealing with, you've assessed whether or not your, your approach will actually benefit the field, then you can go ahead and say, okay, if machine learning is the right way to go, then, then we can proceed. Okay. okay. So again, it's not always the right choice, and the sooner you identify whether this is the case, the better off you're going to be, because I've worked on projects for a long time that ended up going nowhere, because it turns out that a new technology appeared which made the old methods obsolete. So. Uh, the sooner you identify whether machine learning will help your problem, um, the happier you'll be. So now you've decided that machine learning is the way to go. It's the appropriate way to approach the, the task at hand. So now you want to state what the job is of the machine learning algorithm.
which is related to but different from the problem statement. Right? The problem statement is just before we decide on machine learning, just what is the situation? What are we trying to fix? And then the machine learning task is the proposed solution that machine learning is going to accomplish. And for those of you who are interested in research, uh, this is similar to the hypothesis statement for a scientific proposal. Right? So this is a statement that suggests the experiment that you're going to perform or the task that you're going to perform, how you're going to evaluate it. And it also gives you uh, a falsifiable statement in case your system doesn't work. So in this case, given one of those digital FNA images that we saw previously, we can use image features to predict or to build a model to predict whether a patient's tumor is benign or malignant. Right? And what's good about this sort of hypothesis statement is that it suggests the experiment. We're going to get a bunch of images and try to predict based on their image features. And it also is, has a very nice null hypothesis, which is given these images, you can't predict whether it's benign or or malignant. And so based on the, on the metric that you choose and based on your approach, uh, you can use this to sort of determine whether your, experiment, whether your initial assumptions uh, were correct. Okay. So again, most of my time and most of my sort of effort in my lab is focused on like these three boxes. Because if you do these properly, if you, if you have a good problem statement and understanding, and if your collection of data is good, which we'll talk about in a second, then the algorithms you choose are almost trivial. Okay. So most of this talk is actually going to be focused on these three. So the next thing that you want to do is start acquiring data and start looking at it to give you some idea of how you're going to approach the machine learning. So how you acquire your data set is very project specific. Uh, but the one piece of advice I can give you for acquiring data is don't put it off until the end. Uh, I've worked on many projects in healthcare and for government projects where actually getting the data into your system is very complicated and takes a long time. If you're dealing with healthcare, there are privacy and regulatory issues that you need to navigate. If you're dealing with the military, that's a whole other thing. Uh, and so where you store the data may be influenced by the type of data that you have. So uh, in the US, we have uh, patient protection, uh, patient information protection laws that determine where and what kind of systems you can download patient data to. And uh, if that's not in place, then you need to basically purchase new infrastructure in order to house that data. So actually getting the data and figuring out where it's going to go is a, is a pretty big part of the project. There's some questions you can ask about the data once you get it. So what type of data is it? Again, is it images? Is it CSV files? If it's images, what type of images are they? And what kind of compression do they have? Um, if it's uh, patient data that's coming from uh, surveys, then how was that data entered? Was it entered by the patient or by the doctor or by the nurse practitioner? Uh, how big is the data? How big of a hard drive do you need? And every time you download a sample of this data, how much space is it going to take up on your, on your local computer? This also, by the way, has implications for what type of methods or algorithms are actually feasible. Some algorithms do very poorly if you have a lot of samples that are very big. And so um, you want to be able to assess that. What metadata is associated with the data set? So things like when was the sample generated, what's the quality of the sample, and so on. Again, where is it going to be stored and accessed is determined by uh, the rules surrounding the data set. And this is an important one. How is it going to be labeled and documented? Um, I've had a few students who, in the past, who have basically acquired a lot of data, but they weren't careful about where they put it. And so then they had copies of the data, and some of the data was misnamed. And so documentation and labeling of your data is, is critical. Okay. So a good thing to do, as I said at the beginning, is once you get your data, to look at it. Look at the data. Just make sure that what you have is what you expect to have. And so for images, this is as simple as displaying them. And I just put a little snippet of Python code here. It's not really important, but it basically just shows you how to display an image on the screen. So once you get your data, you get a single sample, and you display it. Or maybe you get a random set of images, and you display those. For spreadsheets, it's pretty easy to just print out some of the content. So just take a look. Make sure that all the columns are there, all the rows are there. Uh, make sure that everything, uh, this, this command here in Python, will actually print out characteristics of each feature of a spreadsheet. 
So you can see if you expect a label to be numeric, make sure that it's actually a number, things like that. Again, this seems trivial and it seems tedious, but this will eat up 80% of your time if you, if you don't catch these mistakes at the beginning. At this point, it's a good idea to split your data set into a training set and a testing set. And the idea behind this is to make your model more robust uh, and make sure that you're not essentially overfitting your model. And we'll talk about uh, overfitting in a little bit. But this is also something called data snooping bias. It's basically that when you look at the data, then you get an idea of how to start building your model. And you want to make sure that the only data you look at is the data that you're going to use for your training set. The idea is to pretend that your testing set is something that you've never seen before. So your model design is supposed to be completely blind to the testing data to prevent this. And in some cases, if you're downloading data from somewhere, you can actually split up your training and testing set before you even download the data. So if you have like an image database, for example, you may want to get an ID number for every image, figure out which images go into your training and testing set, then only download your training images. So that way you're not even looking at the testing images before they hit your system. Okay. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this because this can get confusing, uh, but I think, it's, I think it's really important. So training and testing is, is very subjective for different researchers. Uh, how much data should go into training and testing is, a, is an area of debate. Uh, typically about two-thirds of your data is used for training. You want to use the majority of your data for training. And then one-third of your data is going to be used in testing. So you get some idea of how your algorithm is going to do on new data. How you should split your training and testing depends on what type of data you have, whether you have labels or not. Uh, and this is the difference between random splitting and stratified splitting. And I'll explain what these are in a second. So in random splitting, you basically just say, okay, I have a data set. I've got 200 samples in this data set. I'm just going to pick a random thir uh, two-thirds of that and use that for my training set. And the other third is going to be used for testing. If you have a unique ID for each sample, then you could use, use that. And that helps you to ensure reproducibility so that if you run the algorithm twice, you're not mixing up your training and your testing data. So it's random, but it's the same random number each time. Uh, this is really useful in unlabeled data sets. If you don't have any labels, then you could just do this. Uh, but it may lead to class balance problems. So very often, especially in healthcare, the class that you're interested in, the tumor class, is what we call the minority class. It's, it's the class that's least common in a data set of people. Most people don't have cancer, thankfully. So when you collect a data set of a random thousand people, the majority of them are not going to have a tumor. So this leads to a class balance problem because you're interested in the class that is rare by definition. So again, I'm not going to go through this, and it's a little bit difficult to read on the slide, but this is just an example of how to do random sampling. And this is from uh, a book called Hands-On Machine Learning, which is very, very good if you're interested in that book. Um, but this is code that will essentially take in uh, a column of a data set. It takes in a percentage, and it just randomly splits those numbers into uh, uh, training and testing sets. So to just shuffle the numbers and, uh, and give you that. And what will happen is if you print out the class balance, so in the overall data set of benign and malignant cases, we have 63% of our cases are benign and 37% of the cases in our data set are malignant tumors. But if you just go ahead and randomly sample into two-thirds and one-third, then your training set ends up being 61% uh, benign and 39% malignant. And your testing set is 67% benign and 33% uh, uh, malignant. And so this causes a problem because if you evaluate your training set and you get a certain accuracy, and then you evaluate your testing set with the exact same algorithm, you're going to get a completely different accuracy, even though you're, you're performing about the same in terms, of your, uh, in terms of your system. So this is an issue. So to help with that, we do stratified sampling instead. Stratified sampling basically seeks to maintain a class ratio in the training and testing sets so that in both the training set and the testing set, you have the same percentage of each of your classes as you have in your original data set. This makes sure that when you do the, your evaluation, when you have your metric, then you're performing your evaluation on equal terms, which means if you get a 50% accuracy in your training, then you're probably going to get a 50% accuracy in your testing. 
And in Python, again, this is just for example, if you're using Python, uh, there actually is just a function that you can train that will do this stratified shuffling so that you don't have to do it yourself, which is really nice. Uh, so you can create the shuffler here and you can tell it that you want a specific test size and you set the random state so that it performs the same shuffling each time. And then you just pull out your training set and your testing set. Uh, and it makes sure when you look at the class balance that 63 and 37% is reflected in both the training and the testing sets. Okay? Uh, if you're using a metric like accuracy, this is really important because we often think of accuracy as, you know, people always say 50-50 as being like a random shot. But that's not always the case. If your classes are imbalanced, then 50-50 is not the worst that you could do. Random guessing would give you a 63%. Uh, uh, if you just called everything benign, you would be 63% accurate in this data set. So you want to make sure that those kind of metrics are comparable between your training set and your testing set. Okay. So you've got data. You've looked at it to make sure that it's not corrupt and it's all in the right place. You understand what kind of algorithm you're going to use. One of the things you want to do next is you've got your training set. You want to look at the features that have been extracted from that data. This is really important because it helps to provide insights into the data and it helps to drive the design of your system. Okay? Uh, you can evaluate whether there are natural groupings of data uh, and provide correlations between features. So if you extract, let's say, radius and area of nuclei, if the nuclei are all circular, then those two features may be very highly correlated with one another. And so this kind of analysis will help you determine that for features that maybe aren't so intuitive. Uh, so for our data set before, like I said, we have some images of cytology. We have benign and malignant cases. We have a set of image features that I put up a while back. There's 10 features for each nucleus. And then for each image, we basically average those 10. And we also take the standard deviation and the range. And so there's 30 features for each nucleus. So in our case, we're going to take texture feature, nuclei texture feature, as a potential example. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at that feature by plotting a histogram and separating it into its two classes. And so this is what that looks like. So the blue here, I think, is malignant. And the orange here is benign. And what you can do uh, is you could actually look at, so on the x-axis here, we have texture mean. So this is the feature value itself, so what you measure. On the y-axis is the number of samples that fall into each bit on the x-axis. And so what you could do is you could get a sense of, okay, so lower values over here tend to be benign for texture feature. Okay, that's good. Then higher values tend to be malignant. And what we could see is that there's a certain number of benign cases that have very high texture, and there's some malignant cases that have very low texture values. But on the whole, there's kind of a line right here that we could use to divide these two. We could say anything on this side of the line, we're going to call malignant because it's, it's probably malignant. Anything on this side of that line, we're going to call benign because it's probably benign. Um, and what's nice about this is that if you just use this feature to try and distinguish benign and malignant, you get a sense of how well or how poorly that feature might perform by looking at the overlap between these two histograms, right? So in this case, for example, if you have, let's say, right around here, this is maybe 17, right? So if you measure a value of 17, there were, I don't know, more than 35 patients that, had a ben that were benign that had a 17. And there were about six or seven patients that were malignant that had a 17. So if you get a new patient, and that patient gives you a feature value of 17, you'd say, well, you're probably benign. Right? And I use that word probably very specifically. We'll see in a, in a second. But you'd say you're probably benign. What that means is that there were, in fact, some patients who were malignant who had the same feature value, but there weren't that many. On the, on the other side, if you get a patient that's around 20, well, now it's a little bit more even, so now you're less certain. Even though you can assign them, say technically you're more likely to be benign than malignant, but it really is technically because you know, there's very little difference for feature value of that, of that number uh, between the two classes. But like I said, there's 30 features in our data set. This is just one. We can look at another feature, and lo and behold, we get much better separation. We get lower overlap between these two features. So this is average radius, right? And this makes a lot of sense. Again, we want to make sure that our feature values are sort of intuitive. 
And it makes sense because a more aggressive form of tumor might, is going to have bigger nuclei. They're going to look uh, uh, weird. So malignant cases have higher radius than benign cases. And the overlap between them is lower, which means this is probably a good feature to use. Um, so in general, you want features that are descriptive. So you want features that give you uh, that, that are similar within a class and different between classes. And in the context of the histograms, that means that they have small standard deviations and they're far apart from one another. So the means are very different. You want them to be relevant to the problem that you're dealing with. One thing that happens a lot of times in healthcare is there's features that technically are good at separating the two out, uh, but they're not relevant to the problem at hand. And an example would be, let's say you run a cytology lab where patients who you know are high risk are scanned in earlier in the day, and patients that you think are lower risk are scanned in later in the day. So then if you look at the time of day that the slide was scanned, that might correlate very well with benign and malignant, but it doesn't actually make any sense, right? So you need to double check that the features you're extracting make sense. And they should also be invariant. So again, in the case of images, this is my image bias showing, but uh, in the case of images, if you take one of those images and you rotate it, you should get the same set of features. It shouldn't be dependent on how the slide looks, whether it's flipped and things like that. Also in the case of microscopy, if you're interested in doing microscopic image analysis, uh, things like intensity are technically, you should be invariant to things like uh, intensity of the image, because that can change uh, regardless of the image that you're looking at. Okay, so here's one of those feature values. And again, uh, this is the malignant case and the benign case. We sort of fit a curve to these uh, histograms to show that you can literally take the histogram and convert it to a probability. So you're not just looking at feature counts anymore, you've normalized this to be a probability. So that if you measure, so in this graph over here, the probability density function, what this y-axis is giving you is the probability of observing a specific feature value given that you know what class it comes from. So in your benign set of patients, the likelihood that a patient has a texture value of 10 is a little bit less than 10%, right? Uh, so that's the probability of observing a 10 uh, given that you know that your patient is, is benign. What we can do is we can actually convert this into a cumulative density function that gives you the probability that a specific feature value uh, is benign or malignant. And this is what we're actually interested in, right? You're going to be measuring the feature value, and then you want to know what's the likelihood that this feature value comes from a benign case versus a malignant case. So I'm not going to go into the details of how we do this conversion. It's called Bayes' theorem. It's, a, it's an important function for doing probabilistic uh, modeling. And what this allows us to do is take observed data, our evidence, and use that to make a prediction about probabilities. And the important point I want to make here about probabilities, and this is important for all machine learning, is that because they are probabilities, they are going to be wrong a certain percent of the time. And that's just a fact of life. So if you measure a, a, a texture value at about a 16, this will give it about an 80% likelihood of being malignant that means that you're guaranteed to be wrong 20% of the time. That's just the nature of, of statistics. Unless you have a feature that is so good that it completely separates out the two, uh, then there's always going to be some mix of probabilities here. And if you're doing your, your analysis correct, that probability is not a guess. It's actually you're going to make a mistake 20% of the time. Okay. It's an important distinction to remember. Sort of like when you hear the weather tomorrow, 90% chance of sun, and then it rains. Well, you're guaranteed every time there's a 90% chance of the sun, 10% of the time it is going to rain. That's just the nature of probabilities. So this is all using one feature. We can combine features together to get better insight. Right? If you're going to determine the class of something, you probably want to measure more than one thing. So we can do this through the use of things like scatter plots. Right? So in a scatter plot, we take feature one, and plot that on the x-axis, feature two, plot that on the y-axis. So each dot here represents a patient, and its position in this two-dimensional field is given by its value for this feature, and the position in the y-axis is given by the value of this feature. If you were to take all of these dots and just kind of slam them up on the top, you'd end up with this histogram, and if you push them all to the right, then you'd end up with this histogram. So 
this is really useful because we can see that we actually can get better separation between these two clouds. I could draw a line here, right, and separate the points into two halves. And I could say, okay, if you're on this side of this line, then you're probably malignant. If you're on this side of this line, then you're probably benign. All right, so now I'm using two features to classify instead of just one. Um, and this is really important because as you add features up to a certain point, you will actually get better separation, right? Because you're using more dimensions, you're using more information. There's a limit to how far you can go. There's something called the curse of dimensionality, which means as you add more features, your performance is gonna start to drop off. Uh, but if you calibrate your system correctly, you can identify how many features you can use. So this is an example of two. If, uh, if it was possible, you could plot out 10 dimensions, 20 dimensions, 30 dimensions, doesn't actually matter mathematically, right? This is just an example showing two, uh, but I can't plot 10 dimensions on the projector. So um, in this case, we're just looking at two, but mathematically there's no reason that you can't go to higher dimensions. All right, so you've got your problem, you've got your data, you've looked at your data, you've identified some features that might be useful in distinguishing between your classes. So then you actually have to prepare the data that you have for machine learning, and again, this is one of those tedious, but very important and often glossed over steps. So most data that you're gonna get in, in your work and in life is gonna be noisy. Uh, you're gonna have missing or incomplete values, things that are just not in the spreadsheet. You're gonna get some data that's text-based or category-based, and you're gonna get features that are not correctly scaled uh, to a certain and there are obviously ways of dealing with this type of data, uh, but looking at the data and plotting it and looking at the characteristics of the data set will flag certain features as being potentially noisy. In the case of missing data, we see this a lot in spreadsheets and in reports that come in uh, that are created by human beings, right? Uh, humans are notoriously bad at being consistent and we often screw up when we write forms, we leave things blank. And so um, when you're creating a data set, you want to have a way of indicating that a, a piece of data is actually missing, okay? Um, one of the things that is very common is data cells are just left blank. Uh, this can confuse a lot of algorithms. Uh, if it gets a blank, it might crash or it might fill it in with a random number, uh, depending on how it's coded. So you want to make sure that everything is filled in, nothing is left out. One thing that happens a lot of times to great frustration to me is Sometimes uh, I'll get a data set that has some numbers like 99 or negative zero or something like that to indicate that the value is missing. Well, if I'm not a lab technician, I don't know that the number's not actually 99. I had a data set recently where uh, we were looking at different characteristics of patients for a radiology study, and we were trying to correlate structural features with other features of the, of the patient. And there was a column for BMI and somebody had accidentally, instead of BMI, they wrote their actual weight in pounds. I don't know if you know the difference between BMI and pounds, but if you had a BMI of 200, you would be dead. So, uh, but if you don't know what BMI is and you don't know the characteristics of the data set, you might never catch that as being a mistake because a lot of times some of these numbers can actually be in the correct range and just be wrong. Uh, and you don't want to use any kind of ambiguous data that could be misinterpreted, right? So you don't want to use something like NA for not available if that hasn't already been agreed upon because NA could mean salt. So if you're looking at lab values and uh, somebody's blood has a lot of salt in it, uh, then this could be misinterpreted. Uh, you also, so you need to decide what to do with this missing data. Uh, you can drop the data. So if you have a data set that doesn't have a critical feature, you can just ignore it. You can remove attributes that are not complete. So sometimes a particular feature is difficult to get for everyone. So it might be better to just remove that feature from the analysis. Uh, or you can set missing values to some other value. I don't really like doing this, but this is called impution, where you take a, a data point and you look at its uh, most similar other data points in the system, and you sort of fill in a missing attribute with an average. Uh, I don't really like doing that, but, but that's an option in some cases. Text and categories are also a little bit tricky depending on your data set, so these should be converted to numeric values. A lot of machine learning algorithms will require you to use uh, numer uh, 
numerical numbers. Uh, there are two types of these types of features. One is ordinal values, which can be placed in some uh, natural ordering. So if you have low, intermediate, and high, and that's how it's recorded in your spreadsheet. There's a natural order to those numbers, so you should be able to, uh, to convert those pretty straightforward into numbers. And then non-ordinal values can't be placed in any natural ordering, so things like blood type A versus blood type B. Uh, blood type A is not better or more than blood type B, so you need a way to, to encode this because machine learning algorithms do things like calculate distances. And so if you have A, B, A, B, O, or something like that, then if you just give them one, two, three, four, then it will think that a four is four times bigger than one, and so it can screw it up. So there's ways of getting around that. Ordinal encoding is easy. You basically just assign numbers in order, right? So that's pretty straightforward. So low is zero, intermediate is one, high is two. And again, if you're using Python and you're using scikit-learn, then there is a function that will just do this. It'll just figure out for a particular feature what, how many different unique values there are, and it'll assign the correct numbers to each one. Uh, if you're using non-ordinal values, then you can do something called one-hot encoding, uh, which basically means that you're replacing a single feature with several features, each of which is either zero or one. And so uh, I'll just, I typed it out, but it's easier to give an example. If I have five patients with different blood types, A and B, then I don't want to have this. I want to convert it to numbers. So what I'll do is I'll have blood type A, blood type B, and it'll just be binary, whether it's A or B. Right? So I've converted my categorical values into the same number of binary features that indicate what type of blood they have. Right? So patient one has blood type A, does not have blood type B. And again, there's a pretty simple command to do this. Uh, and the last thing, I don't have any text for it, but it's the same idea. It's label encoding. It basically just means you take all the unique values in the data set and you do convert them to just numbers. If you're doing this for labels, then that's okay because uh, most algorithms don't have a, a sense of distance for the labels themselves. Uh, so you can use this for your label encoding. Data should always be scaled. Again, in the case of the, the BMI and the, the pounds issue, uh, if I scaled the data before I did any analysis to it, I might not get that one of the pieces of data was an outlier. Uh, but uh, your data after you exclude that should always be scaled. Uh, scaling should be calculated only on the training set. Remember, you're not looking at your testing set until the very, very end of your, of your process. So you basically calculate the scaling factor on your training set, and then you just apply that to your uh, testing set. So you can do things like min-max scaling or normalization. Uh, so this will create a data set where you have uh, zero to one. And so this will allow you to uh, uh, have a nicely defined range for all your feature values, uh, which is good. Or you can do things like standardization. So this will give you a zero mean and a unit standard deviation for your data. Um, standardization is pretty common. It's not bounded to any specific range, uh, which could be a problem depending on how you're using the data sets, uh, but it's much less affected by outliers, right? So if you have an outlier in the case of min-max scaling, one value that's really, really high, everything else is really low. When you convert that to zero to one, then all those values are crushed really close to zero and one value is close to one. Uh, standardization is a little less affected by that phenomenon. Um, one thing that's very useful uh, for a lot of these situations is to write code and write functions to do all of your data processing for you. Um, this is something that I am guilty of not doing because it's much easier for me to go into Excel and just change all the, all the, co all the uh, columns and then just save it. But the problem with this is that if I ever get a new data set from someone, then I have to do all that over again. And anything you do by hand is likely to uh, have flaws in it. Uh, so you should always write code to do your feature pre-processing. This also enables you to keep track of the kind of transforms that you do to the data set when you first get it. Uh, so you can apply the same transforms each time, even if the data sets grow or they change, uh, uh, your code should stay the same. All right, so now we're at the point where we do model selection and training. So like I said, uh, I'm not gonna go into specific algorithms in this talk, but there are lots of different algorithms to do things like classification, regression, and so forth. Um, and so you need to be able to figure out which of those algorithms is most appropriate for your data set, and you need to be able to evaluate it 
uh, so that it's robust. So model selection is often an art rather than a science, uh, but the general rule is Occam's razor. If you're given a set of possible solutions, the one that makes the fewest assumptions is preferable to all the others. Um, this is often misstated as the simplest solution is probably the correct one. Uh, there are lots of solutions that might be correct, but some of them might be incredibly complicated. Um, so you want to have a solution that gives you the fewest number of assumptions or has the fewest number of parameters in the case of a machine learning model. Uh, because this is going to save you, save you on computation time, and it'll probably also save you in terms of your data burden. So you don't need as many samples uh, to actually create your model. So what does a simple model mean? Well, a simple model could be something like a linear discriminant, which basically, if you imagine that scatter plot I showed you before, it just figures out where to draw a straight line. And it says, anything above this line, I'm going to call one class. Anything below this line, I'm going to call the other class. It's a very simple model because a straight line doesn't have a lot of parameters to it. Uh, it's pretty rigid, and uh, so it's, it's very simple and, and oftentimes very effective. So you can create a model, uh, again, very easily if you're using Python. You can just create a model, fit it to your training data, and then you can create a bunch of predictions uh, just by calling a method on that function that you've created. Um, you could check the performance of the system using something, some kind of uh, uh, performance metric. In this example, it's using root mean square deviate or root mean square error. But you could do all kinds of different. You can calculate sensitivity, specificity, accuracy, whatever you want. Uh, so this is a way of quantifying how good your classifier actually did on the data that you trained it on. You can grow your model to be more complex, so you can choose an algorithm that has more parameters. So something like support vector machines also creates a line, but it creates a line using a number of different parameters rather than just the, uh, the slope of the line. So this has a number of more considerations in it. It looks at uh, high dimensional projections of the data. Again, I'm not going to go into the specifics of this algorithm, but it's just uh, it has more parameters that need to train. So you can fit your model to the data, create a bunch of predictions, and calculate your error. At this point, you're still using just training data. So you're still training a model using your training data, and then you're evaluating using a part of that training. So evaluation on subsets of training data is the best possible outcome. It means you basically have data that you're looking at, and then you're evaluating the model against the same data set. So this gives you a ceiling on your performance, right? Imagine studying the questions on a test, and then you take the test, and it's the same questions, right? You're probably going to do better than if you get a test with different questions. So that gives you the ceiling. If you can't do good on that test, then good luck. Um, so since the system has been trained on this data, it's more likely to do well. So complex models are likely to get 100% performance. So when you do your evaluation on part of the tra uh, training set, it might say that you have zero error on your given metric. This is something that we call overfitting. Basically what it means is that your system is complex enough that it's able to actually uh, just replicate the training data. So it just has memorized the questions on the test. And this problem is, is called variance versus generalization. Right? Variance is the ability of the system to identify trends in the data and actually classify things correctly, whereas generalization is the ability of the model to apply to new data that it's never seen before, right? to answer new questions using the knowledge that it gained from the training data. So complex boundaries, or models that have more parameters, are more likely to fit the training data perfectly. But that means that if you get a sample that doesn't fit that exact contour of the training data, then you're going to get it wrong. Right? And so this is failure to generalize. So in general, the rule is you want the simplest model that's going to give you the best performance on your holdout testing sites. Right? Um, so this is an important uh, concept to keep in mind, that all algorithms are going to make some kind of errors, right? even if they do very, very well. Uh, most algorithms, including us and our pattern detection algorithms, uh, we make some mistakes too. Uh, and so the trade-off between variance and generalization is an important one to keep in mind. Um, and the way that we can evaluate our system is in terms of cost, right? So if you're always making errors, the question is, what kind of errors can you tolerate and what kind of errors can't you tolerate? And is there a difference between the different types of errors that you make? 
So cost, again, to bring it back to the beginning, is defined by our goals and our target performance. And this is incredibly important uh, when we're dealing with healthcare. Right? So should we prioritize some kinds of errors over others? And not all mistakes carry the same cost. So you, you, again, you tell a patient that they have a tumor when they don't. right? So this is a false positive. They're now going for surgery. They're going for chemotherapy. They're immune compromised. They may have complications. And if it turns out that their tumor wasn't actually that bad or they didn't have a tumor, then that's a big deal. But if you're told that you're cancer free when you're not, then you're going to go home. You're not going to get any treatment. And you may succumb to the disease when treatment would have helped you. Right? Uh, I'm not a medical ethicist, so I'm not going to make any statement about which of these is worse or better. I'm not going to try and quantify these. But this is an important characteristic to keep in mind, that not all errors are the same. And if you get into really complex situations where you have multiple different classes with different cost structures associated with them, uh, having a rigorous way of defining the cost and a rigorous way of evaluating the costs of your system is very, very uh, useful. Okay. To get a real sense of the performance of your system, you should take your training set and break it up and uh, train and evaluate on different subsets of your training set. And so this is an example of uh, cross-validation. Okay. Uh, so what if you randomly get really good data or really bad data? If you just split up your data once and you say, okay, I'm going to train my data here and I'm going to test it here, what happens if just by random chance a bunch of bad data was in your testing set or in your training set? Then you have a situation where your performance is either artificially low or artificially high. So to prevent this, we can revisit this idea of training and testing splits through cross-validation. In this case, you create a number of different training and testing splits, uh, and you get all the benefits that we discussed earlier with stratified splitting. Uh, but in this case, you're actually taking different stratified splits of your data to see how the same model, the same algorithm, will perform differently if it's trained on different versions of the training data. So again, as with everything I'm showing, uh, this is very easily done in Python. You can create a uh, cross-validation system and evaluate it uh, given a model that you've trained previously. And again, uh, in this case, I'm training this cross-validation and performing cross-validation using just the data set that I had split off, the two-thirds of the data set that I'd split off at the beginning. So you're basically performing cross-validation on different subsets of your training set. This allows you to get a better understanding of the performance of the system, and you get a better prediction of how it's likely to perform on the data that you, the one third of the data that you held out previously. Okay. So now you have a way to robustly compare different models. And so after you pick a model, it's time to make it better. Right? So you can evaluate all your models using this approach. And then once you find the model that gives you the best uh, trade-off between variance and generalizability, then you can say, okay, now I've chosen my model. It's going to be a support vector machine. Now I want to tune that model so that I get the best possible performance using my cross-validation metrics. So this is fine-tuning and final evaluation of the model. So a lot of times we talk about parameters, which are the things that a particular algorithm needs to learn to understand a particular data set. And we talk about hyperparameters, which is how the algorithm itself actually operates. So things like how the algorithm learns in response to new data. There's a lot of different sort of knobs that you can turn to optimize a particular model. And again, if you have a very complex model, then there might be quite a few knobs. Um, I'm not going to talk about it specifically today, but if you get into AI and deep learning, that has millions of parameters that you can tune uh, to try and optimize your model. If you've already quantified model performance, now it's OK to sort of say, OK, I've done all my robustness checks. I know that this is the model that's likely to perform the best. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start tweaking it to sort of be tuned to my particular data set. So this is going to help you to improve performance. And then once you're done with that is when you finally evaluate it on your testing set. This is a process known as uh, parameter optimization where essentially you try all the parameters uh, for a particular model to see which one gives you the best performance. In practice, this is often an empirical process, which means you're just trial and error. You're trying everything, and you're seeing which one works the best on your particular data set. So as a side note, again, I'm talking about Python a lot because that's what I use. Uh, 
uh, but this can be done using pipelines. So rather than by hand creating a bunch of different models and evaluating them, uh, we can do what most pro programmers do, which is be lazy, and we can create a function that will automatically try every combination of parameters for a particular model. And then using that evaluation setup, it will run that in parallel offline, and then it'll tell you which model and which set of parameters gave you the best performance. Right? So you can essentially build a pipeline that has a classification step in it, and then you can build a set of cross-validation steps which test out a bunch of different parameters of the model. So for uh, support vector machines, there is a gamma value, there's a C value, and there's a kernel parameter that you can choose to define the, the uh, contours of how a particular algorithm runs. And so what you can do is if you set up this object in Python, it will automatically check every combination of all of these parameters, right? So this can get very unwieldy if you try to do it by hand, but the programming will take care of that for you. So you can do what's called a grid search, which basically means you're just testing every possible combination of values for a particular set of parameters against every possible combination against another set of parameters. So this is a brute force approach. It takes a while, uh, but it is somewhat exhausting. So at the end of that, it will basically perform this a number of times. It has a scoring metric, so it keeps track of which models do best given the parameters that we, or given the uh, performance metric that we've told it to pay attention to. And then we will basically fit this grid search to our data and it will perform this you know, hundreds of times. And at the end of the day, we can pull out the best model, make a set of predictions, and then calculate our performance based on that. And again, now, finally, we're at a point where we've tuned everything we can possibly tune. There's nothing else uh, that we can do. We wanna say, how good is our model on that one third of the data that we held out at the very beginning? So this simulates the case where if you only had your training set, you've built the model, you've done everything you possibly can do with it, now you're selling it to people, now they're taking it and putting it into practice in their own work, and they're using new data to evaluate. And you want to know how badly are they, how angry are they going to be when they call me saying that your algorithm doesn't work. So that's what this is intended to be. Okay. Finally, after you do that, this is again kind of specific to uh, to research or to production level algorithms. But if you are selling this, then you want to have some kind of feedback loop where you keep track of how well your system is doing. Right? This is what big companies, Google, Facebook, do all the time. They have their online systems that are constantly relearning, retraining, and they're always looking at what their system is doing uh, to make sure that it's performing optimally. Uh, this section is very implementation dependent, and I have a confession, I have not done a production level machine learning system yet. Uh, so this is uh, just gonna be some, some tips, but uh, there are a few things that you can do to make this process a little bit easier for you. So the first is to write tests that will allow you to ingest your production inputs into the system. So make sure that you can collect data automatically. As I said at the beginning, one of the criteria for setting up your project was figuring out what data is automatically collected as part of the everyday procedure. So this will allow you to take that data and bring it into your system and run tests on it. Uh, write monitoring code to check the performance live. So you wanna keep a running update or evaluation of the data uh, based on, on what it's doing on the actual live performance. You wanna write code for quality assurance. This is good for any kind of system where you don't have control over the inputs, maybe you wanna have a function that will tell you, you know what, this image is too bad, I'm not gonna be able to classify anything, so you just throw it away. Uh, and you wanna periodically audit the system by retraining it on new data, right? So sometimes data gets stale, sometimes it gets old, sometimes people switch from using one type of microscope to another, so all of a sudden you've got a new training set that you, that you haven't looked at before. You wanna make sure that you're constantly retraining and that you're paying attention to make sure that the code doesn't all of a sudden tank because somebody decided to use a new camera for their scanner. And uh, you can automatically back up and snapshot your model uh, if you're doing this in production so that if something does happen and all of a sudden you start to see your performance going down, 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 you can revert to an old model and then try to figure out what happened with your new data. Okay. Okay. So. That's the majority of what I'm talking about today, what I have scheduled to talk about today. Um, some takeaway thoughts. 
uh, from this. So this is really a part of team science. Very often, if you're a data scientist working in any sort of field that, that uh, uses these algorithms, you're going to be working as part of a team. And so you're not going to be responsible for literally every step along the pipeline. Uh, you may be responsible for only some of those steps, but understanding them and understanding the entire pipeline is critical to making the project successful because that way you know the right questions to ask and you know the way that you should be interfacing with people to communicate with them and understand, you know, am I doing the right thing? Am I making the right assumptions? Uh, and is my code doing what you expected it to do at the beginning? Okay. And like I said, uh, tomorrow I'm going to talk a little bit more about specific examples of how I use these steps in my own workflow and some examples from pathology. Uh, but this is, this is something that you can apply, again, to any sort of machine learning field that you might be interested in, whether it's uh, healthcare or, or not. Uh, you can use these steps and they're pretty much universal. Okay. So thank you very much and I think there's time if you want questions.